this is a two lane street that you're seeing um, and the proposal that's sitting here is is to one way this street and to turn it into a 10 kilometre per hour street with the view to creating uh, an incredible pedestrian space. What you can see just in the distance up on the left hand side with, uh, with, with the glass sort of box building that you can see, this is Christchurch's new library and if you're ever in Christchurch, you need to go and visit this place. It is four double, level, double levels of incredible community space. It has a robotics lab. It has a sewing lab. It has all the books. It has a rooftop garden. It is the most incredible example of a community library that I've seen. And so the thinking with the street is that there are so many people who are moving in and out of these buildings in this particular community district that this needs to become a place for people. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Cam Perkins with Urban Pirates in New Zealand. And we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the amazing programs that he and his team are working on in Australia and New Zealand in terms of doing lighter, quicker, cheaper, getting things on the ground and uh, making some big change happen. Uh, I'm excited to share this with you. So without further ado, let's get to it with Cam Perkins. Well, Cam, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. So wonderful to have you here. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, <laughs> super keen to be joining you. Um, long time uh, listener, first time caller. <laughs> Fantastic. I really appreciate that. And uh, why don't you just take a moment to uh, share with the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, cool. Okay, so my name's Cam Perkins. I am the director of a change agency called Urban Pirates. And we help local government and central government agencies with building capability in what we call adaptive urbanism. And that has really come about from being a frustrated practitioner trying to change streets in our cities and wondering, where does the brief come from? Who writes the brief? So that sort of led me uh, over my career to wanting to understand how we write better briefs to get better outcomes in our cities. So... That's probably um, a big part of the discussion today, John. Fantastic. That's great. And when you say brief, uh, what does that mean mm -hmm. in, in sort of the, the the terminology and technology from, from, from your perspective? I'll pull up your website here. Yeah, cool. Yeah, awesome. So as someone who has trained as a designer, I'm a landscape architect, my my clients, when I'm working on cities, are writing me a brief which says, here are the sorts of things that we'd like you to work on. Here's the problem that we'd like you to solve. And often we can look at the whole system of a city and think, you know what, there's probably a little bit more here that we can be doing right. within our remit. And so when we have those conversations with clients, sometimes that brief has taken a long time to put together and people are very invested in it, and we don't get an opportunity to revisit it, which which sometimes means that you miss a few opportunities in, in what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I, I appreciate that, because that was some terminology. I'm like, oh, I don't, ever, I don't know that I've ever heard it mentioned like that. Uh, you know, obviously city master plans and visions and, 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 and things of that nature. But that particular perspective and the way that you had that phrase, I was like, oh, I, I need to ask him about that. <laughs> so that's great. So uh, you mentioned landscape architecture. So take us back. What was sort of the beginning of your career and how did you sort of wind your way into doing uh, this type of work where we're a professional rule breaker? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, landscape architecture wasn't my first degree. My, my dad uh, left school at 14 and he really wanted me to go and get an education. And throughout my schooling, he prepped me and said, son, I want you to be an engineer. Engineers are, are doing great things in the world. And I tried that for one year in university and I failed every single subject. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a really great time cooking barbecues. And I sort of learned that I was um, that I was quite good at talking to people. And I went and saw a careers advisor and this person said to me, have you thought about landscape architecture? And this is back in 1997, 98. 
And of course, I'd never heard of that degree before. And I thought, well, I'll give it a crack. And that was sort of set me off on this trajectory. And I had this incredible mentor as as uh, one of my first professional roles, who was a really celebrated destination hotel and resort designer. So this is someone who'd worked all over the world, and he took me under his wing and uh, sort of took me around the world with him. And uh, so I had this 15 years of trying to understand how to design destinations for people. And, yeah, that, that picture that's up on the screen is, is one of those places. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, – and that is an interesting perspective too because when – when you think of and I and, and I can relate too. I, I spent a, a decade living on uh, Hawaii Island, the Big Island, and so when you live in an area that is a destination for people to come in and experience that, you end up having a, a, a different appreciation for the qualitative nature of the landscape and what you're presenting to people, and and trying to ensure that that experience is a special experience. I have a feeling that that's going to be a common thread as we go into it, it, your, the way your uh, career sort of uh, twisted and turned. So what then happened after you were doing this? What sort of prompted the next stage? And what was that next stage? Yeah, so the, the, the picture that you can see on the screen was, is, is called uh, Sabanias Island. It's an 80 square kilometer island off the coast of Abu Dhabi. That was one of, um, of the projects that I'm most proud of, that one most sustainable tourism destination in the world when we finished that project. My goal with a lot of these projects was, was I, I was really hoping that when people were on holiday and they could see this incredible landscape, this incredible place they were part of, I thought, what if they go back to their everyday life and think, you know what, we really need to look after this place. Right. And it now feels a bit misguided because I don't think it really worked for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, like youthful, uh, youthful hope, right, with this right. stuff, you've got to try these things out. So the next stage after that sort of started to become working with clients in cities and in particular big private developers who held large portions of cities and like multi-building holdings who started to talk to me about how do we create a great destination precinct in a city? And that's where I started to sort of understand what it meant to have this trade-off between place and uh, movement in a city. Right, right, yeah. And with that comes, you know, this, this concept of, is this a place that is truly welcoming and inviting to everybody? Yeah, yeah, completely. When we go on a holiday somewhere to another city, um, we come back with these great stories of the places that we've seen, the sort of life that we've watched. Stephen Burgess from Hobart in Tasmania, a good friend of mine, he always says you don't come back from holiday with snaps of the best car park that you snagged. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and what and the 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 photo that's uh, the picture that's here with these children in front of this mural. One of the things that is is it depicted on the on the mural is the uninvited, and so getting going back to that theme that I just mentioned is is this a place that is um, welcoming and inviting to everyone to all ages and abilities? Talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, cool. So uh, the two children you can see in the picture are my two children. This is, um, yeah, so my kids sort of like follow me around in cities, uh, sometimes uh, happily, sometimes they get really bored with dad sort of like just dragging them around to all these great spots. Um, and in particular, I love this idea of urban regeneration and adaptive reuse. So how do we use the assets and spaces in cities that we already have this particular spot was, um, this photo was taken in Brisbane and this doesn't exist anymore. This was a, a it's, it's a very ephemeral place. It was an old blockbuster video building. Okay. And there's a, a, a crew of, um, of graffiti artists called The Uninvited who do these incredible murals. And it really got me thinking to uh, who are the invited in some of our curated city spaces and therefore who are the uninvited. 
And often in these planning and design processes, we are, we're catering to a small part of the population. And what I started to see was, was this right to the city sort of um, conundrum, right? So I'm having this, uh, I've got these questions around, well, we design a lot for, say, you know, cycling and walking, but what about skateboarding? What about, say, scooter riding? And you've seen in Paris this sort of like kick off against the, um, the scooter sort of thinking. So it's like, what modes are we designing for? Who are we inviting into our spaces? Because if I go back to the example of great places that we've visited around the world, we often come back with pictures of lots of very different looking people who we haven't seen before, you know? So um, for me, there's this question about who are we inviting into our spaces and how are we designing spaces to be, uh, to, to cater for, for all these different people. Yeah. And of course we have uh, here a, a skate park, this skate park, there's something special about this too. Uh, what's the, what's the story behind this location? Yeah, cool. So this, this sits in the largest six star green star development. It's a brownfield development in the sunshine coast of Queensland in Australia. So that's maybe an hour and a half north of Brisbane. And this place is a town centre and it was designed to be completely skatable. We had these, these incredible discussions with the developer at the time when we were reviewing a master plan for this place. And the master plan showed much of the children's play and all of the activity happening way, way, way away from the town centre. And we started to really probe and question this and say, well, if you're trying to build a place for people and for young families and for activity, what if we thought about bringing activity into the town centre? And that was a really interesting journey that sort of opened up this place, which you can see right now is in full-blown event mode as a skate event, but this is the town centre that gets used in many, many different ways at different parts of the day. I love this too, because it kind of exemplifies one of the reasons why I love uh, multi-use paths and, and places that really welcome uh, people of all walks and abilities and across a multitude of different modes. You know, this is a, a city center that is functioning as you mentioned, you know, in a variety of different ways, it can be, you know, this event or, you know, maybe a musical thing happening. But in this particular context, on this particular day, you know, that handrail is now a skate rail, <laughs> you know, for them to do some hot tricks. Yeah. Yeah. So what was really interesting during my early landscape architectural career is I had clients from cities saying you need to put skate protection on these things uh, as in stop people skating on our furniture yeah yeah and it didn't really sit right with me i was thinking well you know what i've been to these i've been to these great plazas all over the world where there's huge crowds of people who sort of gather around to watch the sorts of ways that people use space particularly skateboarding i i'm i'm not a skateboarder myself right uh, but I really appreciate the the time and the skill and the dedication that goes into learning how to do this thing. And I thought, surely that's something we should be harnessing in cities. Yeah. Now, earlier you had said, you know, something very profound is that we don't go, you know, on vacation and what, but whatnot, and then come back and talk about, uh, you know, how how amazing the parking was. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, I think that, you know, that's that's a little bit of, of what we're trying to communicate here with this image is that we're we're you, you don't talk about, oh, yeah, th that was amazing. I was I was in Paris, you know, back when Paris had a motorway next to the Seine. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And this um, this image is is again from uh, from Brisbane. So Brisbane's where I grew up. Um, so there's there's a few images and sort of things from around that sort of area of Australia. This this particular image is um, is, is a bit of a, a golden triangle right in the centre of Brisbane, and it sits on the waterfront as you can see. So the rendering on the page shows some some quite intensive development. Uh, you can see and imagine the size of the towers that are going up in this place. 
what we are trying to work with with uh, um, with the developers, so the owners of this particular place, um, was thinking about how do you how do you draw the river and, and the green space that people associate with Brisbane back into the city. So how do you move through these buildings to get to the river's edge, and how do you move from the river's edge to go back to the city? Brisbane's a very subtropical city. It's it's a beautiful green place, and so we were starting to think about what is the future of this place? How do you make this a really accessible public edge to what is a very, very private uh, realm up in these buildings? Yeah, yeah. And this brings us back around to what you were talking about earlier is, you know, who's setting these visions, who's setting, you know, who's writing these uh, these uh, plans and, and putting together the brief. And, and then we decide, well, why don't we ask the little people? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this um, you can see we're, we're all everyone's smiling in this image. So this is um, th- this project marked my transition to Auckland. So as a consultant, I, like I said to you at the start, I was trying to figure out where the briefs were coming from, and I, I had a phone call from uh, from one of Auckland Council's. Regen- it, it's the Regeneration Agency. It's one of the agencies, and. They were saying, you know what, we're we're really keen to find out what you do. Do you want to come over and um, do you want to come over and uh, pick up this role of looking at the regeneration of the waterfront? And one of our first projects was was this place, which was actually a car park for fifty cars, and it's right on the waterfront. If you know Auckland, this is um, there's there's a beautiful harbour that we would all be looking at in that photo, and yet that public space was filled by 50 cars. And so we we were working on a research project with one of the local universities and it was called Kids in the City. And it was focused on uh, the agency of children to be part of the design processes in cities. And most of these kids are children who actually live in the city and therefore this space that you can see is their backyard. Right. Yeah. So. This one was about working with this group of, of children and taking them through a design process as a collaborative design process to be able to inform a future brief for this place. And so that little bit of green that you can see in the front was one of the one of the parts of the, the demonstrations and the tests and the pilots that we made to show what this place could be like if it wasn't a car park for 50 cars. Yeah. And that's a very interesting thing that you just said there, too, is pilot and demonstration and being mm-hmm. able to visualize things in a different way. And that's very much a part of the future of where you end up doing even more work because you uh, you end up, uh, especially, you know, when you when you go back and you look at, you know, that landing page for your website and you take a look at, you know, the, that's the spirit. I mean, yeah, we're doing, we're, we're professionals, we're rule, we're professional rule break, breakers for positive impact. And you can see that you are implementing some lighter, quicker, cheaper pilot projects and really leaning into tactical urbanism to try to communicate. And then, and, and also in the case of like with the kids being able to say, okay, help us design and reimagine what this public space could be. Yeah. Totally. That was one of the things that uh, I I started to understand when I was working in public service, and I got to sort of see behind the scenes of what uh, an engagement process was looking like, and we really started to to test and to I suppose prod and pull at some some government and local government policies, right? So. There are particular ways that some city councils like to engage with their citizens. And sometimes that's really collaborative and sometimes that can be uh, that can be quite controlling as in wanting to control the message. And so what we were starting to do in, uh, in the case of Auckland was to really look at those systems and those processes and say, well, who are we inviting into this place? Whose place is this to design? And how does that inform the way that we use this street? Yeah, yeah. And the, the this uh, couple of images that you sent over on High Street here is uh, is a great example. You know, it's a before and after. So we've got this is the the before picture, 
and uh, we, it's a pretty standard streetscape. It, you know, it's it 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 is interesting in, in in how it's all kind of laid out. It is one way, obviously, with parking on either side, and then the after ends up being this. Yeah. I still look at this after picture and I think this is, it was such an incredible transformation that we got through. And we got this through because of the way that we worked with the people who live, work and play on this street. And it was the first time that a street like this had been, had been done at this scale in Auckland. So we, we were starting to, to to try and understand what were some of the issues on the street that would inform the way we might approach the design change. And you can see there's lots and lots of cars that are, um, are stacked in on either side there. What we started to see through observations is that the user experience on the street was terrible for everyone. Right. As in, if I'm someone who is a tradesperson who is coming to fix something that's happening in a shop, I can't find a park because all of the loading space is taken up by uh, people in private vehicles. Equally, we have images of fire engines and ambulances not being able to move up the street because they're getting stuck, like physically stuck with cars. And the footpaths that you can, well, you can't quite see them in this picture, but the footpaths were really, really narrow. Yeah. And we did a couple of tests with some parents with prams and ask them, what, what's your experience of pushing a pram with your child in it up the street? So what we started to do then was to socialise this idea of the fact that the user experience wasn't working well for anyone, so we needed to change everything. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm glad you mentioned, you know, loading zones and things of that nature. There's still a little bit of parking. There's some loading zones up ahead. And so you you created a, a more balanced, more humane, more people centered approach to this. And you can just tell just by looking at, you know, how chaotic and dissatisfying and uninviting this particular uh, image is. And it gets, you know, incrementally a bit better here and that's nice yeah totally the really interesting thing that um i haven't been able to replicate since with this project is that we we planned this we we planned the intervention so carefully and all of the elements were prefabricated off site we were able to install like change that street in three nights and we made that promise to retailers saying we will not disrupt your business yeah that was one of the key, um, one of the key, uh, I suppose, pieces of feedback from um, from our partners on the street who were saying, we support the change in the street, but we can't have a six month construction process. Right. And so this this time lapse that you see here, which is one of my favourite videos that came out of the project, this is showing the the works that happened at night. So the street was open during the daytime, so so pl- people could trade. But we came up with a system that was a no-dig system. It has a 10-year design life, so it's semi-permanent. And everything like those planters you see being put on the on the ground were all uh, designed, fabricated off-site and brought in. So after, th- you know, each day people would see some incredible change had happened by these fairies and elves that worked on the street overnight. Yeah. And th- this is really, you know, really powerful. And I love the time lapse on this because it really, you know, kind of exemplifies or, or kind of leans into the fact that, yeah, we got this done fast. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. What was what was the. That relationship with the public like of trying to communicate this um, too often these days, I get the sense that we, you know, whenever a bold moves, try to move forward. Uh, we end up with a backlash and the, the, the term status quo comes up a lot. Whenever you try to push to try to change the status quo, the status quo resists <laughs> and, and will do so quite aggressively. But then again, it's not just the status quo. It's also a portion of the population that just kind of gets caught up in misinformation and fear kind of comes in. Talk, Talk us through how you all uh, navigate through those challenges when you're doing these types of interventions. Mm. 
This has been something that I've been thinking about for a very long time through my career. And it started way back working with private developers in resorts, trying to think about how do I, how do I propose doing something slightly different to the norm? Doing something different is really is challenging for people and it's an evolutionary trait. It's built in hardwired to our brains saying change, uh, change is not good it, <laughs> because we like things to be the same because we can then predict what's going to happen and that means survival. So that's the, the sort of the hardwired piece in that brain. So I've been thinking for a long time about how to help people with change. What I, what I kept seeing was that when people had an opportunity to interact with what the change looked like, as in the physical environment, they were able to adjust, people are able to adjust habits and they're able to have a discussion about what the change means, as opposed to looking at a drawing. So we are so used to handing people a picture or a plan and saying, what do you think? And of course, the first response is, well, this is going to change 105 things in my life. Right. Um, and that is often a really difficult conversation to have with people. So the first steps with, with working in that particular uh, example on High Street that you saw was what we call, what we call a concept of 1,000 cups of tea. Mm-hmm. And this is about building really solid relationships with people who are in that area so that you're building a foundation of trust that you are going to move forward with your project on. And so when we think about the people who are very, very resistant to change, sometimes it's a better idea for us to put our energy and uh, focus with those who are willing to champion change in order to in order to build that support for the sorts of change that we need at a big social level. Right. Yeah. So the what what I coach uh, my a lot of my clients on these days is about um, is saying don't put your energy into working with curmudgeons. Match your energy with the people at the front of the change curve because those people will be bringing along the the middle who are undecided. Well, and you're and inviting really them. Good. You're inviting them into the public realm and say, "Hey, let's have a yeah. cup of tea, or let's 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 grab a totally. bite in in this in this space." And and to your point, it's not trying to like appreciate the you know that process, that typical open house or or communication or engagement, uh, public engagement process of with the drawings and and the the vision plans. It's like, hey, let's. Let's do something physical. Let's, you know, let's get something on the ground so that we can, you know, be in that space. And that's why I love uh, that tactical urbanism, you know, pilot spirit, pilot project type of spirit is let's get something out there, lighter, quicker, cheaper. Let's demonstrate it. Let's do some tweaks. Let's get feedback immediately while we're there. Then we can do some pretty bold uh, steps and we can do some stuff that, you know, normally, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to do and you wouldn't be able to accomplish something as extraordinary as say, uh, oh yeah, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do, uh, a street and th- in that street, it's going to be, yeah, like 10 kilometers per hour. It's going to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, this, this is an interesting one. What you're seeing on the screen is a particular street in Christchurch in New Zealand. If you know a bit about Christchurch, um, that city was almost completely levelled yeah. in earthquakes uh, a number of years ago. And so the city has gone through a rebuild and there are many amazing, beautiful urban spaces popping up around the city. And this particular district is the theatre district in Christchurch. And this, this street is part of an acceleration program that I've been involved in, and it's called Streets for People. It's run by uh, what we know as Waka Kotahi, and that's the NZ Transport Agency. And you had a little while ago, Catherine King, as one of your guests, who is the program director for Streets for People. So my role in that program is to run the capability work stream. So we're thinking about what do local government need to need to know? What knowledge do they need? What skills do they need? And what beliefs do they need to be able to rapidly reallocate road space? 
So this is a two lane street that you're seeing. Um, and the proposal that's sitting here is, is to one way this street and to turn it into a 10 kilometer per hour street with the view to creating uh, an incredible pedestrian space. What you can see just in the distance up on the left hand side with, uh, with, with the glass sort of box building that you can see, this is Christchurch's new library. And if you're ever in Christchurch, you need to go and visit this place. It is four double, level, double levels of incredible community space. It has a robotics lab. It has a sewing lab. It has all the books. It has a rooftop garden. It is the most incredible example of a community library that I've seen. And so the thinking with the street is that there are so many people who are moving in and out of these buildings in this particular community district that this needs to become a place for people. And so this is the first step to, to move towards that, um, that, that vision of the future and to have a real life conversation with people in a real life setting, as opposed to asking people on a plan what that might, what that might mean. Right. Right. And as you mentioned, uh, Catherine King and the Streets for People program there uh, for the, the, the country of New Zealand. And that's one of the challenges, too, is to try to take some of these learnings and some of these experiences from the city level and then trying to apply them out nationally and then hopefully eventually globally. That's it. That's the secret, right? So this is the secret of the of the systems piece that we all need to be thinking about is how do we become how do we become people who are focused on learning and focused on sharing lessons and how do we do that in a really safe way and how do we do that in a way that demonstrates consistent progress so streets for people as an example is currently a three-year program what came before that was a one-year program and that tested a few things out and that gave us some evidence about how to build the next program before that was the sorts of demonstration projects like High Street. This was all set up intentionally with the view to thinking about what does a 10 year progression of, re, uh, of road space reallocation, what does that look like and how do we get there? And so when we think about this sort of idea of system change, in order to scale up physical change, we need to think about the system that is allowing that to happen. And so that system is often local and central government policies and processes that map out how we do these sorts of projects. What I find with many of my clients in New Zealand, Australia, globally, is that some of those rules were written 10, 20, 50 years ago and no longer apply to modern cities. Yeah. So what's our biggest challenge to try to uh, take these types of initiatives and programs and, and, and try to get them disseminated out to uh, other cultures, other places. And it's good that you had that experience early on um, in, you know, far away places of doing work because it gave you that early on and in your, in your career uh, experience of working in completely different environments and completely different cultures. I think that there's certain things that are very much human nature and human behavior and things that we can kind of grab onto. But at the same time, there there has to be a, an appreciation for cultural differences when we are, you know, trying to take this to maybe South Africa or somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. The, um, the question of culture and the question of what is a norm in our everyday life? What is a norm in our family? What is a norm in our neighborhood, in our town, in our city? That can also apply to our own training. So when we think about how, say, I might train as an engineer versus how I might train as a landscape architect versus how I might train as a sociologist or a, ge or a geographer, we are taught through education processes and taught through the norms in our families and our neighborhoods about ways of thinking and models of thinking and models of seeing the world. And often when we're challenged by new things, we can either 
be curious about what that means and uh, how to understand what that means. Or sometimes we can shut it out if we're not ready to be able to welcome that into our lives. And that becomes a, a really difficult thing to work with, but it's a place where we need to think about how do we create safe places for this conversation to happen. And so when we start to apply this idea of, say, psychology to to city building and to city shaping, this is going to help us to understand the innate human that's at the centre of these change processes. So helping people to feel safe and creating safe places for cultivating conflict in a safe way um, is, I think, and this is my theory, is, is I think the way that we can move forward with this stuff. Yeah. And you are playing a very interesting role too, because I see, you know, when I see this sort of, of positioning, marketing of, you know, seeking opportunities for disruption and talking about uh, trying to upset the status quo and, and change, you know, what's, what's kind of the way that things have been done. But at the same time, you have developed a level of credibility of working with municipalities and working with governments. And so that's a, that's a really special balance to have to have because it's very, it's too, too often uh, folks will, will, you know, that pendulum swing will, will go too far and they'll be just activists and, and, you know, you know, agitating for disruption and change, but not really working well with others, <laughs> specifically the leaders from above. So, so talk a little bit about that, because I mean, there, there's that balance that has to be done. And especially when you're talking about tactical urbanism and trying to maybe do things from the ground up, you know, a, a movement coming from, from the ground up, but at the same time, uh, hopefully, ideally you've inspired, you have an inspired leadership so that you can go also from the top down. So from the ground up and the top down, talk a little bit about that. Cause that seems to be that niche that you're playing is helping facilitate both the ground up and the top down. Yeah. I, I must admit, I found myself in this really interesting place and it's not really by design it, it, it it's sheer happenstance that i'm sort of i feel like i'm balancing on my knife edge a lot of the, a lot of the time a lot of what i'm doing and i'm trying to find that spot within the system that balance within the system where you can just push it enough yeah uh you can just push it enough by testing things out and um are stretching things in different ways maybe breaking a couple of things and showing that um, that that it's okay to do that sort of stuff. So that comes back to this idea of of um, of creating safety and creating a network of support around people when we're doing this sort of stuff. So what I'm increasingly playing around with is the idea of how to use communities of practice and communities of interest to bring together people who are trying to do this stuff because. What I've found is that if you're one lone person trying to do this in an organisation, it's very, very easy for you to be, say, you know, moved to the side, restructured, uh, uh, put in the dark office down the end of the corridor, you know, <laughs> um, and not invited back to play. And I've had those experiences. And so when we think about, okay, how do I get an invitation here to play? Because I need to, I've seen that I need to adjust that system or that we need to adjust that system. I'm thinking about how do you how do you bring together a network of champions within these organisations who can then start to agitate for this sort of change? And how do you bring together a very diverse group of people who can become trusted messengers inside that organisation? So you are very right that um, my position within some of these organisations, particularly calling myself an urban pirate, uh, raises some eyebrows right. with, uh, <laughs> um, with 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 people who are uh, people who are used to seeing a certain way of working, and so we have to think about how do we deploy trusted messengers within organisations who understand what we're trying to do and can help us to communicate that change, and so that means often working with people in very diverse situations who aren't used to working together. Yeah. And so when we can help by building these communities of practice, 
demonstrating that we've got support from a group of people to be continuing this change and when we can communicate what that change looks like and build an evidence base of what that means, that's when we start to get traction. And so the, the architecture behind these change programs is, is about that, uh, that idea of a, a learning individual, a learning group of people and a learning organisation. And that's sort of what I feel is my next step is thinking about how do we really build up a proper learning organisation as in let's evaluate this and design with evidence. Right. Now you, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're only one person, but uh, you're one person with some bold uh, plans and ideas. Uh, talk a little bit about your uh, 10,000 cities mission. Yeah. So one day I'm sitting at my computer and I'm thinking, you know, I've been working with a few cities around the world. I wonder how many cities there are, how many could I work with in my lifetime? And Google tells me there's about 10,000 cities in the world. And I, I, I went looking for what does 10,000 things look like? And 10,000 things is only a grid of 100 by 100. That's it. What I'm starting to see with my work in cities is, is the power of being able to share experiences and stories. And so my mission is thinking about how do we work with 10,000 cities around the world to tell great stories of change and inspire the sort of change that we need in cities because we know that cities despite their very small uh, their very small footprint in the world are consuming most of our energy most of our resources and by 2050 i think we're about 75 percent urbanized across the planet bruce uh, bruce mao um, speaks about this idea that by 2050 we'll have about 10 billion people on the planet and I heard him speaking once and he said, you know what, by 2050, of those 10 billion people, 5 billion are not even born yet. So those people will be born into the systems that we design today. So you won't have to change their mind. And that was a real revelation for me. I thought, oh, okay, when you break it down that way, 10,000 cities, 10 billion people, it's maybe possible. It might not be in my lifetime, but something that I've learned from New Zealand is this idea of designing for seven generations ahead of you, thinking about seven generations. So that's the sort of movement that I am working on in the background to build, but I don't tell many people about it because it sounds so large and so crazy that some of the responses I get, well, that's not possible, but I love being told that I can't do something because it just spurs me on to go and try it out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and guess what? We're broadcasting this out to the world right here, right now. <laughs> so, hey, we're, you know, we're going to reach every corner of the world, you know. Amazing. If yeah, they can excellent. access YouTube, that, that is truly the, the amazing thing about this platform. Kim, uh, is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you want to make sure that we leave the audience with? Look, I think, yeah, there, there is. I think if we... If we can think as, as practitioners who are trying to create active towns, active cities, is that we need to start with our own place of learning first. We need to understand how to be more curious and that curiosity is a bit of a muscle that we, uh, that we can work and that we can stretch. I would recommend a, um, a couple of books and I'm just trying to think, uh, Ian Leslie, there's a book by Ian Leslie called um, uh, Curious, and there's another one by Leslie called Conflicted, which have been two quite seminal books in my life, which have really made me think about how do I become more curious about the ways that people are feeling when we're proposing change in cities. And I found over time that if we can be more curious, we, st we can step into someone else's shoes and understand what it is that's driving them and what do they need to feel safe in a change process. And it really leads us to this realization that all the problems that we face in the world are people problems. So if we can focus on those single relationships, on building networks and on that idea of 1000 cups of tea, 
as in relationships are the foundation for all the change that we need to make. That to me is the message. That's the key message. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, Cam. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure uh, connecting with you all the way across and, the world. And, and the same, John. Yeah, the same. <laughs> uh, I, I love the questions you asked. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to be able to explore a few things that I hadn't thought about for a while. Um, and, and, and also you're challenging me to um, to just sort of talk about this way of, of, of change. So thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and I hope uh, if your listeners have any questions, then they can come through you. Um, but otherwise, uh, join the mission. Jump on board. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for, for those watching this on YouTube, uh, please uh, feel free to leave a comment down below in the comment section. I'll be sure to let you know, Cam, uh, if any uh, questions pop up that really need you to you uh, address them personally. And, uh, and I can always get those uh, forwarded to you. Uh, and again, thank you so much uh, for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been an absolute honor. And the same, John. All right. You have a, an awesome evening where you are. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Cam Perkins. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.